Welcome to the lecture on mathematical finance. In this first lecture, I would like to explain to you some basic notions of financial engineering. In particular, I would like to discuss in some details the consequences of the so-called no arbitrage principle, which will be later on a guiding principle when we come up with treatable mathematical models for financial markets. But before coming to that, let us agree of a certain uh, amount of notions. And the first one is the notion of a financial market. And we would like to understand on a financial market nothing else but a kind of platform uh, where institutions or individuals meet and uh, trade financial securities. And financial securities could be either bonds, shares, futures, options. There's a whole zoo of different products. And uh, some of them uh, will be important for us later on, but I come to that. And you see, there are different form, forms of platforms um, available. Regulated ones, like stock exchanges, and unregulated uh, ones, uh, where you um, uh, trade over the counter, meaning one bank is calling uh, another bank and offer to them a certain contract on a financial security. What are the goals uh, in that lecture? Well, or not only in that lecture, but in mathematical finance. First of all, uh, we would like to specify uh, a model from financial markets. And during that lecture, our assumption will be that uh, the, the, the model is in discrete time. Once we had that, have that model at hand, um, the next thing we would like to do is um, uh, we would like to compute fair prices uh, for financial security. Of course, that's why we introduced that model. And you see, typically these financial securities uh, are linked with certain risks. So their prices are in some sense risky, whatever risky means. And we would like to have an access to uh, that risk. And we would like to find strategies how we should um, deal with that. Uh, another object uh, and goal of that lecture and math finance is to derive optimal trading strategies. In particular, if we would like to minimize uh, certain risks. However, we can not do that in, in, in arbitrary financial markets, uh, but we will consider instead of that an idealized market, which I would like to call a perfect financial market. And how should that perfect financial market look like? Well, first of all, uh, we would like to trade uh, financial securities at arbitrary quantities. A second, um, short selling in that perfect financial market is allowed. And with that, there are no costs associated. Moreover, we neglect transaction costs and taxes. And we also neglect the fact that our trades may have an impact on market price. So in reality, so this is what you can observe, right? If, you, if, there, if there is a huge investor and he buys at one point in time a, a certain fraction of all available um, uh, stocks from one company, uh, then this will definitely have an effect on the price. But this we will neglect here. Another important assumption is that all market participants should have full information on all prices. And this is in reality also not fulfilled because they are big players which have much more insights in, in prices than other ones because some of these prices are not reported to everybody. Um, 
We will also neglect liquidity, liquidity issues, uh, meaning that neither companies nor states can go bankrupt. And what we would also assume is that traders behave in a rational manner. And whenever we deviate from these uh, assumptions, um, then we would like to call that uh, market friction. And today's research uh, focuses on understanding the effect of this kind of friction. Well, what we should discuss now is, well, how does the price of the financial security is built, right? So what we should we assume about the price of a financial security at a point in time? Of course, there should be guiding principles of demand and supply in the background. Um, and here's a microscopic perspective with, which reflects that in, in, in some respect. So what I have plotted uh, to you here is the following. Suppose there's a one particular financial security you are interested in. And not only you, but all the market participants who are interested in this financial security may have an opinion about its value. What are you willing to pay for it in order to buy it? Or what, for which price are you willing to sell it to someone else? And uh, you see here, um, these diagrams should be the number of people which have the opinion that uh, that is the right value for the financial security. And you see some of them, um, so these, on the other hand, these green ones are the, the sellers, so the guys who hold uh, this financial security in their portfolio. And they also have an opinion about what should be a fair price, for which price they are willing to sell this, uh, this um, financial security. And they also sit here. But this, the problem is you don't have to these informations. And imagine now you have that picture on a daily basis. So meaning that from one day to the other, you can update your opinion. Depending on the news you get or whatever factors there are around. And it could be that at some point in time, uh, so that's so to say the, the distribution of the opinions and maybe at next day it could be um, that that guy changes its opinion uh, to a lower price and that one changes its, its opinion to a higher price. It could be that uh, this buyer jumps in their opinion over that uh, seller and then we would like to say well at that point in time a trading took place and maybe then we can say okay since a trading took place, there was a price these both parties agreed on. And maybe uh, we can define the midpoint in the moment when they jump um, as, uh, as a price at that point in time. Maybe that's a, a decent uh, microscopic model um, on, 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 on these opinions. And then you see we can derive from this distribution a distribution of opinion, a value for the price at a certain point in time. The only problem is uh, this is highly complex and we have no good um, um, assumptions how this opinion should be updated. And for that reason, we take more a, phenomeno a phenomenological uh, perspective saying instead of modeling all that we directly try to model the price and what we have learned from that well all these opinions are somehow hidden we have no access to it why not uh, model the price at a particular point in time as a random variable and you see we get then for every day 
um, um, another random variable, so we get a sequence of random variables. And in physics, that's 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 a, a decent concept. If you don't know and you, you believe there might be something random in the background, why not model it in a random fashion? But there's a huge difference between physics and financial mathematics at that point in time, because in physics, you can go to your lab, you can set up uh, an experiment, you can do measurement, and you can repeat that uh, experiment and the measurements the next day. And the outcome will be on a comparable scale. They should be the same, more or less. Depends on the precision of your measurement. On the other hand, in financial uh, markets, it's hard to make these kind of experiments. You cannot say, okay, I take one billion, I go to the market and I do a kind of experiment. It will uh, affect the market. And if you do that next day, you, your outcome will be completely different because the market participants will realize and will react in a completely different way than the day before. So it's hard really um, to do justify what should be uh, the distribution uh, of uh, these random variables. So that's why ad hoc uh, um, assumptions enter the game. And that's the warning which, which I would like to, uh, to point out to you here. All the models which are plausible on, a, on, on some scale, and we will, you will see later on, and come with a certain couple of assumptions. And whenever you apply the conclusions from these models, which we will derive during the lecture, um, on real-world financial markets, you have to be aware of the set of assumptions you made uh, when modeling uh, the financial market. And please keep that in mind. Okay. So uh, up to that point, so we agreed on the on the fact that it might be a good idea to model prices as random variables, so prices of financial securities. Now let us have a closer look on what kind of financial securities we are really interested in during that lecture. So and the first one is um, what is called a bond, or more precisely, a coupon bond. And well, a coupon bond, if you have that in your portfolio, it guarantees you a payment, capital C, and this is called the face value, at the maturity time, capital T. And moreover, it guarantees you payments of these coupons, T1 to Cn, at the coupon dates T1 to Tn. And whenever you have a bond uh, without any coupons and with a face value of one, you call it a zero coupon bond. And here you see an illustration of the payoff profile once you have that uh, bond in your portfolio. Meaning at time uh, point T1, you receive this coupon T1. At time point T2, you receive this value C2. And at the maturity, um, you obtain the, the face value and by accident the coupon date t5 coincides with maturity so you also obtain your coupon at that point in time and here a couple of remarks due to the assumption on uh, that we are only interested in perfect financial markets uh, it directly means that uh, these kind of bonds are risk Free securities. You, you, once you have it in your portfolio, you receive your these payments are guaranteed. You receive it at that at these specified days. Uh, and second consequence is that coupon bonds are simply linear combinations of zero coupon bonds. Why? Well, in order in order to um, realize that. Uh, coupon bond via zero coupon bonds, well, what do you need? First of all, you need a C1 zero coupon bond with this maturity T1. Then you need C2 uh, zero coupon bonds with maturity T2 and so on and so forth. 
and at the end of the day you also need capital C plus uh, little c5 um, zero coupon bonds with maturity time capital T and adding up all these zero coupon bonds you have um, um, obtained um, the same payoff profile as for the coupon bond and so what are typical models for the price of a zero coupon bond with maturity t at a time little t uh, which is uh, between zero and uh, capital t well one typical model is that you say well it has a price at the time little t given by one plus r to the power little t minus capital t and you see when little t is equal to capital t you get uh, the price is equal to one and that's exactly the payoff which you will get and um, it is smaller than one for uh, in case um, r is positive and is larger than one in case uh, this r is uh, smaller to zero but it has to be uh, larger than minus one and this uh, value r is um, interpreted as uh, an interest rate the second um, uh, financial uh, security we are interested in are so-called derivatives and what is that well a derivative is, is simply uh, a financial security which those the payoffs depend on an underlying uh, financial security and this underlying uh, this security, this reference security is also called underlying. Well, uh, and a derivative is called an option if the payoffs are non-negative. And here are um, three examples of derivatives. The first one is the so-called forward contract. And there's nothing else but the right and the obligation to buy or to sell at maturity time t the underlying financial security with price st for fixed value k and this value has been specified at some point in time at this point uh, i would like to call zero and you see here the typical uh, payoff profile for that forward contract well if um, the price of the underlying security is above capital t you gain that amount of money why well you have the right and the obligation to buy uh, that uh, security at that point uh, capital k however on the market the price is much higher so you immediately sell it and that's the profit you make on the other hand if the price of the underlying security is smaller than capital t k since you are since there is an obligation to buy well the payoff is negative so that's an example of a derivative which is not an option the next example are so-called uh, European call and put options. And uh, once you have a European call option in your portfolio, it gives you the right, but not the obligation, to buy at maturity time t the underlying uh, security at a price, uh, uh, those price is denoted by S capital T for strike price k. And this strike price k has been specified um, at some reference point and this i would like to call zero again and you see here the uh, the payoff profile changed uh, why well to so imagine is the price of the underlying security is above capital k well what you can do well as before um you can make a profit well why yeah you are you have the right to buy the underlying security as 
uh, at a price capital K, but you can immediately sell it on the market for a price a capital ST, which is higher than K, and so you have a positive uh, um, payoff at that moment. On the other hand, if uh, the price of the underlying uh, security is less than K, well, since you have only the right but not the obligation, you do nothing. Meaning in that, uh, um, in that situation, your payoff is simply zero. Um, and if you consider, uh, instead of a call, a put option, well, then you have the right to, but not the obligation, to sell uh, the underlying security at a fixed uh, strike price K. And you also see in that situation, well, if the underlying price capital T is higher uh, than the strike price K, well, then you simply sell um the security directly on the market so you do not execute the um, this put option on the other hand if the uh, um, price of the underlying security at maturity is smaller than k then you exercise the security as uh, the option and you uh, get a positive payoff so and you see that's the difference between uh, the forward contract the forward contract, uh, the underlying security, um, uh, or the forward contract was in a relation, in a linear fashion, uh, related to the underlying security, and these options are now in non-linear relation, as uh, so the payoff profile is uh, connected to the underlying um, security in a non-linear fashion. This is what I wanted to say. So why are um, these financial securities interesting and useful? And that's, well, for the following reason, namely um, on the economy, call and put options have a stabilizing effect. Why is that the case? The reason is the following, you lock in, upper and lower bounds for prices to buy and sell. Let me explain that to you in, a, in, in more detail. Imagine you are, you are a company. You in order to produce a certain good, you have to buy on the market, let's say, some fuel you need in order to, for the energy to produce it. And uh, the price for the fuel in the future may change. But you would like to do a calculation now and you would like to have, let's say, a certain upper bound on the maximum price you have to pay, let's, uh, pay, let's say, in two months. And in that case, uh, you should go for a call option. Why? Because it gives you the right to um, buy in two months the fuel instead of the market price for that uh, strike price K if the market price is uh, higher than the strike price. Whereas if it's lower, then it's not, uh, um, it's not a problem because then you can buy your fuel directly on the market. So it's really an upper bound on the price you have to pay. On the other hand, suppose you are a producer and you would like to sell your product in two months on the market because it takes some time to produce it and maybe the, the price for your product may change in the future and you would like to lock in a, a certain um, lower bound um, on the money you will receive when you when you sell it then you should go for a production and you see in that respect uh, um, these call and put options stabilizes economy. However, for financial markets, call and put options have a destabilizing effect. Why is that the case? Well, here's an example. Uh, suppose you have an amount of uh, one euro on your bank account and you're 
interested in investing it in, um, in a certain financial security, let's say a stock, and you have the idea or you believe that the value or the price for the stock in the future, let's say at capital time, he, uh, 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 will increase. What you can do now, you have two different strategies. The first strategy is you take your euro, your all your amount you have on the bank account, and you buy for it um, the, the the fraction um, one divided by st of that uh, stock, and, and then you put it into your portfolio, wait until cap, uh, time capital T, and then you sell again uh, that financial security, that stock. What's your payoff? Well, um, if you're right, and uh, the price uh, of the stock increases, well, you get the amount capital T minus um, uh, ST um, as a profit. Uh, times uh, the number of share, uh, shares of that stock you, you have in your portfolio. That's one strategy. The other strategy is instead of buying directly that stock, buy instead a call option on that uh, stock with maturity time capital T and with the strike price which is given by today's price. What is the pay off in that situation? Well, it is uh, given by uh, the price of the, the stock at maturity, at capital T, minus the strike price, and this was ST, the positive part of that, times the amount of um, uh, call options you have in your portfolio. And since typically, and we will, I would like to explain that to you in a moment, and um, the price for the call option is much smaller than the price for the financial security, you gain much more out of that. That's the advantage. However, it could also be that, that your opinion that the price for that stock will increase in the future uh, might be false, right? And uh, in the first strategy, where you directly uh, bought uh, the underlying security, you still have money left. Well, you lose lost something, namely the difference between uh, today's uh, the price at maturity times uh, the price when you entered into the market. Uh, however, in the second situation, where you um, buy instead of the financial security that call option, you lose everything. And in that respect, there's a, a destabilizing effect coming from um, trading um, call and put options. And the last financial security which we will um, face with during the lecture are so-called American call and put options. And what is the difference between American call and put option and a European one? Well, uh, the right to exercise it. Um, namely, in the, for the uh, European call and put options, you could exercise it at maturity. And here you could exercise it up to maturity, meaning that um, the American call option gives you the right to buy uh, um, um, the underlying security up to time capital T, the maturity, for the specified uh, strike price K on which we agreed, let's say, at time point zero. And um, since call and put options um, are the most common types, they are also called uh, vanilla options, and uh, this name comes from the favorite uh, um, ice cream sign <laughs> uh, um, Amy vanilla ice. That's the background. Okay, since we discussed now the basic financial securities, uh, we should discuss in some details uh, what should be a, a price for these options.
right? What can we say about these prices of vanilla options? Uh, and can we somehow express the prices in terms of the prices of the underlying? Let us first have a look at an European call option with maturity capital T and strike price K. And I would like to denote by CT and uh, the, the price of the call option at time point little t and by ST the price of this underlying security at time point little t. Well, first of all, what should be a fair price at maturity? Well, you see the payoff for an European call option is given by the maximum uh, of the, um, uh, the price of the underlying security at maturity minus the strike price uh, and zero. So we only take the positive effect. And I claim that this would be a fair price at maturity. Why is that the case? Well, imagine the price would be smaller than that value, then it would be in your favor because you buy that option for that price and you immediately sell it on the market and that's the, what you get, right? You execute it immediately and that's the payoff you get. And there you ha would have a benefit. So it's in favor of you, but not in favor of the seller of that option. So be And on the other hand, if the price for the option is larger than the value, um, then that payoff value, then it's in the favor of the seller because it, he gains money from you. But I claim that this, um, this observation immediately gives you uh, the following upper bound on the prices of an option, namely that they are bounded from above by the prices of the security. Why is that the case? Assume that this relation is not true. What does it mean? It means that there exists a time point little t before maturity oh. such that the price of the option is larger than the price of the underlying security. Now let us set up the following portfolio. It should consist of one security and minus one uh, call option, meaning that we go short for the call option, so we sell it without having, so we have to rebuy it at some point in time, and we buy that security. We keep that portfolio until maturity, and then we sell the security and we rebuy the um, European call option. So what is the profit? Well, at time little t, our profit is exactly this difference, namely the difference between the price of the call option and the price of the underlying security. And by assumption, this is strictly positive. On the other hand, um, the profit at maturity, so we have to now sell um, and so we have to rebuy the call option. So that's the price, which we have seen here. And we have, uh, we will sell the security. So plugging in what you have observed here is nothing else but minus the positive part of ST minus K plus ST. Now let's distinguish two cases. Suppose ST is larger than K, then we opt from that uh, sum or that difference here, just k, and k is uh, positive. Whereas in the case that st is less than k, this um, positive part here is zero, and we obtain from that uh, difference here simply the value st, and st by assumption is also non-negative. So what have you seen here? In both cases, uh, we obtain a, a, a positive K 
cash flow. So we have found here a trading strategy which allows us to create out of zero initial capital without any risks a profit. And this is called an arbitrage opportunity. So this is simply a trading strategy which guarantees a riskless profit without um, any um, net cash outflow now or in future time. And the most important assumption for uh, that lecture will be that we consider only financial markets where there is no arbitrage opportunity. And this I would like to call an A principle. So what are the consequences from that NA principle? And this I would like to illustrate in the following financial market. And this should consist of a zero coupon bond with maturity capital T. And the price uh, is denoted by B little t capital T or any point little t then, uh, which is smaller equal to capital T. It consists of one security. So the price is denoted by ST. And we would like to include in the financial market also one European call and one European put option on that uh, security with maturity capital T and strike price K. And the prices uh, for the call uh, are denoted by CT and the price for the put option uh, is denoted by PT uh, for time points and little t, which are smaller equal to capital T. So what do we already know from the observation we make here? made here? First of all, uh, that the price of the uh, call option at maturity is given by the positive part of the difference between the price of the underlying minus the strike price and by a similar reasoning the uh, price of the put option at maturity is given by the positive part of the difference between the strike price and the price of the underlying security and there from that the positive So the first lemma I would like to prove to you um, states the following. It's a, a way to compare portfolios. So we assume that the uh, non, uh, no arbitrage principle holds true. And suppose uh, you find um, uh, a vector x in R3 in such a way that um, if you multiply as uh, first component with the price of uh, the zero coupon bond at maturity um, plus um, um, x2 times the price of the um, underlying security at maturity and so on and so forth. And that sum I would like to abbreviate by Vt. Let's call that the value of our portfolio. And let's choose that little x in such a way that the value of our portfolio is uh, non-negative. Then uh, it follows that the value of our portfolio is non-negative for all times before maturity. In particular, this apply, uh, implies that when we know that the value of a portfolio at maturity is zero, then it implies that the value of our portfolio is zero at all time points. Well, how should we prove that? We do that by contradiction. So let us assume um, that uh, the statement that the value of the portfolio is non-negative for all times before before or equal to maturity is false. Well, then we know that there has to exist a, a time point little t such that the value of the portfolio is negative. 
So, and at that time point, uh, let us set up the following portfolio. Exist of X1 um, um, zero coupon bonds, X2 securities, X3 um, call options, and X4 put options. And whenever uh, XI is positive, it means that we bought these um, uh, securities from the market and whenever they are negative, then, then it means we go short, we sold it without having it, so we have to rebuy it at maturity. So we keep that portfolio at maturity and then we unwind it. So meaning that we sell that amount of um, zero coupon bonds, uh, that amount of securities and so on and so forth. So what is our profit? Well, the profit at uh, time little t is exactly given by uh, that uh, quantity, which is equal to minus vt. Why is that the case? Well, if we have um, an amount of x10 coupon bonds, we had to buy that, and that's the price we had to pay. That's why it's negative. And the same holds true for the other financial securities in our portfolio. And you see that assumption here guarantees us a positive uh, profit. On the other hand, when we um, sell our portfolio at maturity, that's the profit we get. And by assumption, we know that that profit is uh, non-negative. So you see, we have here found uh, a strategy uh, in such a way that all um, uh, cash flows are positive and this simply means that we have found an arbitrage opportunity but that's in contradiction with the, ex uh, with the um, assumption that the market we consider is uh, satisfies the no arbitrage principle. Hence, uh, our assumption that uh, we find a time point where the value of the, uh, of the portfolio is negative has to be wrong and we have proven that statement. And you see the second statement simply follows by replacing x by minus x. What is that lemma good for? Well, it is good for proving the following parity between uh, put and call. And what is that? Well, suppose that uh, the uh, NA principle holds true then it is true that um, the price of the call option plus k times the price of the zero coupon bond is equal to the price of the put option plus the price of the underlying security and this is true for any point t up to uh, maturity well how to prove that it's rather simple. Well, let us set up the following portfolio. It should consist of um, K0 coupon bonds, minus one security, one uh, call option and minus one put option, meaning that we buy K0 coupon bonds from the market. We sell one security, we buy one call option, we sell one put option. So what is the value of our portfolio at maturity? Well, it's simply given by K times the price of the zero coupon bond, since we have that in our portfolio. Um, since we uh, go short for the security, we have minus ST in our portfolio because we have to rebuy it. Uh, we have uh, CT. The European call option in our portfolio, and we have to rebuy um, the put option. And now you see, now you can plug in. So, what's the value of the price of the zero coupon bond and maturity? It's simply one. So, that's why we get here the K. The price of the um, uh, call option under the NA principle is simply that positive part and the price for the put option at maturity is given by that positive. Now let us distinguish two cases. Suppose that the price of the underlying security at maturity is 
greater or equal to k. So then we see that this term here is simply st minus k, which cancels uh, that term here, whereas that term is not there, so we get a zero. On the other hand, if the price of the underlying security at maturity is less than k, that term is zero. Here, that term is there, but with the minus sign, it exactly cancels out that part. We get again a zero. And this is also illustrated here um, in this pair of diagrams. So you see uh, the price of the call and the constant price of the zero coupon bond. You see they add up to that profile, whereas, uh, uh, wherever on the other hand, uh, here is this pair of profile of the put and this linear profile of the security adds up to the same profile. But once we know that the value of um, our portfolio at maturity is zero, we can apply uh, the lemma of the comparison of portfolios, which simply tells us that our portfolio has to be zero at any time before maturity. And this is equivalent to that um, uh, equality we wanted to show. Well, before coming to an end, uh, let me briefly sum up what we have seen in that lecture. We were encountered with a couple of um, notions from um, financial engineering, which will play a crucial role in later lecture. This is before uh, financial securities um, um, we get to know during this lecture. And what was also important that we discussed how we should model uh, prices. And also we discussed a little bit what are the drawbacks of the, uh, this modeling. I need to assume that the price itself is a random quantity. And we have seen that this non, no arbitrage principle is rather useful because it gives us, without assuming anything else, how the price should behave, certain statements or certain relations um, between call and put options. Uh, and just for, uh, for curiosity, these uh, relations between call and put options has been discovered uh, in the end of the 60s. So rather it's not so old as one might expect. So once we set up all these notions, we can now start uh, with mathematics. Namely, in the next lecture, I would like to introduce the needed tools to later on describe um, the price process and to do all the computations um, in order to uh, compute the price for call and put options, either European or American.